we should be much more flexible in thinking about what is an architecture firm like in the 21st century. Episode 133. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I am your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I am talking to Alan Dempsey, who is the architect, entrepreneur and founder of Next, which is a London-based design studio. Now, this interview was actually recorded in a post, actually in a pre-COVID world, towards the end of 2019 or the beginning of 2020, I think it was. Um, And it was a really interesting conversation. I had the opportunity when we were still allowed to go and visit Alan in the studio of Next up in Clerkenwell and actually see how the office was practicing. And we spoke about a lot of things. Alan has got uh, an entrepreneurial past. He set up and owned several businesses from a young age. He's always had a passion for design and architecture. He's got a deep amount of experience also in working on the construction side. He was actually a consultant at Langer Rourke uh, between 1998 and the year 2000. Um, after that, he was actually project director at Future Systems. So we discuss a few of the insights that he gleaned working there. And then we discuss how he has grown the business at Next and some of their current projects, um, how they've won work, how they've grown and how they've evolved. So this is a really insightful conversation. So sit back, relax and enjoy Alan Dempsey of Nex. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. So massive thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the Business of Architecture UK for the last couple of years. Big shout out to those of you who have come to our live events, attended the webinars, and of course to those of you who have downloaded the weekly podcast and have been listening to them on your bicycles. And as you know, we love helping architects win meaningful and profitable work. But it's not always that simple to implement these ideas or translate them into something that will work for you. So what I wanted to do was to to invite you onto a quick 15 minute chat with myself. We can both grab a cup of tea and I'd like to ask you about what content you found most valuable and why and what you'd like to hear more of. And I'd also love to hear more about your business and what you're building at the moment and where you are headed to business wise in 2020. So there's no charge or any obligation with this call just simply to find out how our content has been of value and if we get that far and with your permission of course what might be next what what might be possible and how Business of Architecture UK could be supportive of that. Does that sound fair? Brilliant. So if you want to book a 15-minute chat with me, I'm calling these calls the BOA UK Discovery Call or just simply a chat with Ryan. Use the link in the information and I look forward to speaking to you. And I think in appreciation of the complexity of cities you see in a very raw way there that uh, in in europe it's it's a bit more managed Mm -hmm. um, whereas cities are much more dynamic things in in south america yeah and and the issues they have with infrastructure with transport all of these things are barely kind of working and controllable uh, because they're growing at such a, a an amazing rate so i think that really excited me and interested me and the last thing was the landscapes course the landscapes were just spectacular so you can live in Bogota and it's about uh, 3,000 meters above sea level mm. and it's kind of slightly spring like all year round but then you can go down the mountain for two hours and it's tropical uh, or up the mountain even and go skiing but just the the kind of presence of landscape um, and and kind of weather yeah really was was amazing that's quite an extraordinary experience to have yeah. during your architectural education and then that and then you went from there into to the AA well I, I, I came back through London uh, after my year out and I, I hadn't really spent any time in London before and I, I spent a couple of weeks here and it interested me so I thought once I finish my thesis maybe I'll come back uh, and that 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 that's actually what ended up happening I came back here after I graduated ostensibly for three months holidays and that was 20 years ago um, I just stayed. I loved it. Um, and interestingly, 
when I came over, I really had a, a very strong desire to work on some projects that, um, for me, bridge the gap between um, architectural thinking and, and, and materiality and making yeah. on quite an ambitious scale. But I didn't want to work for an architect. I felt this a, a real gap in my understanding and knowledge between designing and making. Mm. So I went to work for a contractor. Uh, at the time they were called O'Rourke. Now I think they're Lang O'Rourke. Right. Um, but I worked on buildings I was interested in working on. So I, I was working as a, an engineer, a site engineer, uh, on a building called Monte Vetro, which is a Rogers building down on the river. I know the one that's sort of the yeah. wedge. So I worked on that yeah. for a concrete contractor. And then I went to work uh, in a, on a Conran project for a short time on Liverpool Street Station. They were turning it into a hotel. And then I went to work... Uh, out on the Jubilee Line extension in Canary Wharf because I was interested in working for the concrete mm. subcontractor and just seeing how the formwork was done, seeing how it was poured, being given the insane responsibility of setting out some of it, um, which I was probably not too equipped to do. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that was great experience. And then I thought uh, after about six or eight months of that, I had enough experience of concrete, so I went to work for the steel fabricator who was building the extension to the Science Museum uh, at the rear. It was an MJP project that used very large span steel beams. Well, was your role as, as an architect in those no, kind of positions? I was, or an, I was as an engineer. As an engineer, right. really setting out. It started out as a setting out engineer, and then it kind of grew into uh, assistant project manager, managing logistics, managing the teams, understanding the workflows and the processes and the program and how they're doing, but it was entirely site-based. Yeah. Uh, so I did that overall for about two years and it gave me an extraordinary kind of grounding in, in how you make things yeah. and, and how uh, the people who make things, how contractors think about their projects and how they approach them. Uh, and it, it gave me a kind of confidence that when I did start practicing as an architect, um, it, it really changed my perception of that step from design to making mm. and and also gave me huge confidence in working with contractors uh, in a way that, you know, it takes a, a very long time to get as an architect if you're just office-based. Yeah. And, and so it was a great experience. And, and when, obviously when you're working in uh, as an architect in those on those types of larger infrastructural scale mm. projects, you're... Maybe your experience in them can become quite sort of blinkered. So having mm. a, yeah. a sort of a view from the other side, if you like, kind of really enriches your understanding of that. Yes, and it, it gave me a great sense of when, of how they think and when to push them. Right. You know, an understanding of their side of the table, let's say, and when to push them and when to work with them and how best to work with them. Uh, what they're concerned about, where they perceive risk and... Mm. and uh, how to address that in the projects we do. And I think we've taken that through all the projects we've done over the years. We tend to really like to present contractors at tender stage and really take them through a project and uh, explain it in terms that addresses what they might be concern concerned about. So how did you make that transition from working on that aspect of mm. construction and then working for an architect? And you went, was it... You went to work for Future Systems? Well, after, that, after two years of being on site, I thought that's enough um, experience. Um, <laughs> and I, I went back uh, to college and I did a master's at the AA. Right. And I went f for a very specific reason because at the time, the use of computers was really sort of um, becoming quite interesting mm. and I had never been in particularly interested in, in computers in my undergraduate because it was very much understood and used as a drafting tool and people used AutoCAD and they drew things and it introduced a bit of efficiency into the office but for me creatively it didn't hold a lot of interest and, and then all of a sudden around sort of uh, 2000 that was starting to change and stuff was happening in, in like my thesis in undergraduate was about an information technology center in Bogota. So I was interested in this use of IT and the use of computers. Mm. Um, and I came across a couple of programs at the AA that were really asking very interesting questions about how one might use computers and use uh, digital systems in a creative way. And that for me, I was 
hugely interested in. And then there was one particular program at the School of Design Research Lab that was probably conducting an even more radical experiment, which was the idea that architectural design is not about authorship. It's about collaboration. Mm. Uh, so the course was structured in a way that you had to undertake your thesis as a collaboration, a group of two, three or four people. Right. And that to me was frankly mildly terrifying. Yeah. You know, I just couldn't conceive with, with the undergraduate education I had, it was very much studio based. It was about the sketch, the drawing, the idea and how you nurture that from initial concept through to a, a building design under the guidance of a, a group of tutors, but it was a very singular kind of experience. Yeah. And there was a very strong emphasis on, on authorship and vision. And so to, to, to sort of have this other environment that suggested actually, no, that's not really an accurate reflection of the way architecture might happen. Mm. Um, and certainly not in projects that you might have today, which are dealing with many complex uh, things, it's a collaborative process and it can, at its inception, creatively be a collaborative process. I thought that was completely compelling and quite yeah. scary. So I was like, okay, it, it might be good to make myself uncomfortable for a couple of years. And, and um, quite, quite unusual for architectural education to have, to have that. It was, and it was one of the early graduate design courses that were really talking about this. And I think it's that, that idea and methodology has since spread a bit to, to other institutes and other programs but you know they were the, one of the few courses that I could find certainly that mm. were doing it early on so so I kind of threw myself into it and it was completely uh, I suppose altering experience in terms of my outlook and my perception of what it is we do yeah um, um, and how we maybe can address some of the bigger challenges we have to deal with and the complexities we have to deal with today. And how did that influence your then your your the next path part of your working career? Uh, so I worked I worked for the um, for a small practice for a couple of years after I left uh, that were doing some nice international projects. So I worked in Tokyo for a while, I worked in Wisconsin for a while, and then projects in London. Um, so it was a nice, interesting place to be mm -hmm. for a while. And then uh, I went to another firm that was a bit larger that allowed me to work on slightly larger projects. Um, it was called Future Systems. I don't so I was there for four years and it was a really uh, amazing experience because I joined at a time that the office had sort of shrunk in size after right. um, Selfridges. Uh, they had done a couple of seminal projects like Lords yep. and Selfridges, um, but they had shrunk back down to about six people when really? I joined. You yeah, got as small as that? Mm. Wow. And, and then by the time I left four years later, I think it was approaching 50 again, 45, 50 or something. So it was a really interesting time to be there and just growing with a rapidly growing studio. What were some of the key lessons that you learned about that culture? Because that's obviously it's one, one of these kind of hugely influential yeah. practices yeah. in the UK. And so and even now the work is so it's yeah. so unique. Um, I, I think I learned the importance. There was a few things that, that were hugely enriching for me. One was, I mean, the importance of a clarity of vision about what you're doing. Um, and I think Jan and Amanda, uh, when they were working together, were an extraordinary um, partnership yeah. in that they, they were so complementary and they brought so many incredible skills to make a, a hugely successful studio. Um, I think they both brought incredible vision and interestingly, often people ascribe Jan as the visionary, but I think they both have a strong vision. And also interestingly, Jan was also one of the most practical architects I've ever worked with who would... Uh, sit down with you and draw a detail at one-to-one -one kind of on a weekly basis, mm. you know, hugely kind of concerned about how you put things together simply and elegantly. Yeah. Um, I think what I took from, from Amanda as well was an extraordinary capacity to understand that the architectural project is about culture as much as vision, and it's the culture you build in a studio in an office space. Uh, that can support creativity and, and the best creative thinking, drawing mm. the best creative thinking out of people. Um, she has an incredible ability to do that. 
How, how, well, how did they work with clients in terms of being able to sell them into these incredible ideas and very ambitious projects? Uh, you probably should ask Amanda that. Um, she's a better place to, to, to tell you that. But I think, I think what I always appreciated about the firm was from the very beginning when you came into contact with them, it, they always worked they were quite intentional about creating an environment that changed people's expectations yeah. for what an architect can bring. Um, and as soon as you shift people's expectations or at least open their minds to listen to something different and to listen to a different vision, then you can actually be quite bold in what you do and never underestimate the power of being ambitious and confident in setting out a vision um, but also they were incredibly practical minded in my experience in, in some respects like if you look at projects like you know Selfridges or any of these they were actually built quite economically and they sometimes a bold vision is actually uh, a strategic decision about how to use a budget very effectively so you know they, they always reiterated the fact that the, the the cladding on Selfridges was the same cost of a standard commercial mm. cladding. It was just about a very different conceptual approach and strategic use of where you spend your budget. And how did you move into Next? So you start up Next in 2009? Yes, and very end of 2008 and early 2009. So, and it was just a decision. So right at the most difficult point in the economy, yes, in the middle of a recession. I think, I think I remember the day I handed in my resignation, the front page of the Times more or less <laughs> said, run for the hills, you know, it, the sky is falling in. And it, it, it was uh, perhaps a foolhardy decision, mm. some would say, but also, you know, interesting thing, things happen when, when in times of change. So I, I had a bit of follow-on work leaving, but otherwise there was no big project there. There was no, you know, sure client or um, or way of right. sustaining the business. So it, was, it wasn't it wasn't the nice sort of here we've got three projects going no, on and it didn't, didn't happen at all like that. It happened very much about okay, if I'm going to start, uh, where do I start and how do I go about finding work? Um, yeah. So there was, there was a couple of tiny things at the time, but I think when I set out with the firm, it was you know, always with an ambition and a vision to work on projects um, that reflected our interest. And my interest has all, always been uh, fundamentally focused on the relationship between the building and the city and, and how the building can respond to that and mm. how maybe you can question that boundary and threshold. Um, and that's kind of, I suppose, been reflected in many of the projects all the way through uh, the practice, this interest in the city, whether it's a public space, uh, an external public space, or it's a kind of idea of an urban interior. Um, but they're not easy projects to win yes. when you're starting. So it, it's certainly taken some time. And how, how, well, how did you win those first projects? Um, we've built the company really and the projects we've done around competitions right um, which is an incredibly challenging way to to build a business but on the other hand it's given us opportunities that we would never have otherwise had so we've I think got to a point now where 10 years in we've won 12 competitions uh, but that's allowed us to work in sectors as diverse as higher education culture uh, infrastructure, transport, uh, commercial workspace, uh, higher education again, uh, I'm just looking around, um, and a lot of kind of small urban projects. Yeah. Uh, we started, you know, very first project I did while still at Future Systems actually was a collaboration with a good friend and colleague, Alvin Wang, uh, on a small pavilion for, for the Architectural Association, uh, that they had a, a kind of open, limited competition, open to graduates, and we, we were lucky enough to win it. And That was the DRL, the yes. DRL 10, and it, the uh, shell. Yes, it, the, exactly, the small concrete shell. And, and that in, 
captured a number of interests immediately. One was a sort of interest in innovation and technology and how one might use it mm. to design and make space. Uh, but secondly, this interest in public spaces in the city and how you know small things can have a big impact. So that that's quite a a, a risky strategy. Um, competitions and there's obviously lots of architects have lots of different opinions on mm. competitions for you what makes a successful competition how are you able to kind of mitigate the risk of of winning work like that um, what makes a successful competition beyond winning it um, is it, it, it's important how it's run right and I think as we've grown a bit uh, we've we've been fortunate enough to, to move from sort of very open ones where you really odds are very low to competitions that become a little bit more selective or restricted and, and uh, invited and um, so that helps um, but other than that I think the early stage the early days and even some of the ones we've done recently have been really just about the quality sometimes of at least the approach of the thinking and then after that of course it's about the team and the people you bring to it mm. and when I started next it was always about if there is a way to work on these projects that surely has to be around this idea of trying to demonstrate that thinking and through the relationship between the building and the city can let's say add value and create something uh, valuable both to the people that use our cities every day, but also the build, people who own these buildings yeah. um, and, and or use these buildings. Yeah. And that takes time to work through projects to be able to show it because you can talk about it uh, and people just don't get it. But when you begin to be able to show it, they do understand and pay attention. But the other thing that's important and, and was really around the idea of the company name or this sort of Nex or reference to Nexus was a a thinking, a, an approach to design is collaboration. Mm. So from the earliest stages when, when it was just me, it was really about how can I develop relationships with other consultants, with other uh, interesting creatives that help enrich that conversation um, and, and allow us to work on slightly, at a slightly larger scale. So when you're uh, pitching for competitions, you're able to actually pitch the process in terms of it being collaborative as opposed to just a, a singular vision or a solution? Yes, uh, yes, and I think we've always, I, I always have this mantra about it's the best idea on the table and it's kind of irrelevant where that comes from. Mm. Um, so that takes a lot of work to sort of just get over the ego and, and to try and build a team where that is the same, you know, that ethos. Uh, is reflected in everybody and everything we do but it, it seems to have worked you know this idea seems to have worked and you know lots of people talk about collaboration but we really try and embed it deeply in what we do what does what does it mean to you what's what's the what is what are some of the foundations of successful collaboration and when does it not work or what 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 can pull a team apart and what can bring a team together um, I think what pulls a team apart is being proprietary, um, especially early stages. It, uh, and, and in some ways, the idea of domain of expertise can pull a team apart as well. Mm. You know, it's, it's it, 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 where people feel constrained to make a comment or make express a view mm. or, or champion a perspective that someone says you're not qualified to make that call. We're arguably have been grossly unqualified to present visions for a lot of the work we've done, but actually it's bringing that different perspective that has been inherent to, to the success of the projects. That, that's quite interesting that you say that, that often some of the competitions that you're going into, you might not have necessarily the experience in that specific building typology. So how do you, how do you, how do you communicate that you can, you're capable of doing it? Because this is obviously something that many architects find it very hard to get over as a hurdle, particularly when trying to move into mm. new sectors. Is yep. how do we, how do we enrol the rest of the team that we are we're able to do this, even though we've only got experience in this type of building typology? For some clients, 
it's written out, you know, who might be very risk averse. Yes, and you need to have demonstrate you've done three identical projects before. Sure, where I'm, I think everybody's familiar with that, and particularly when you start to look for work through more formal processes like PQQs and frameworks and that kind of thing, it, it is a prejudice. Yeah. That's kind of insidious. Um, I would say we try and do it through a number of ways. One, we, we try and bring some of the expertise uh, that addresses where we might have shortcomings. Um, and that can be other consultants. Um, so, so it builds a depth in the team, uh, let's say, that, that helps support that. But I think also we try, we try and listen very carefully um, at the beginning and really um, dismantle and understand in quite a bit of depth what the essence of the problems are in any brief. Mm. And then we try and challenge that um, and very often come back with an answer that's sometimes slightly unexpected. Um, but we try and challenge it in a well-grounded way. Uh, so, for example, I'm, I'm trying to give you some examples. We did a competition a couple of years ago, <clears throat> which unfortunately we didn't get to build, for a, a Formula One team and a campus. And, and it was extraordinary that somehow we managed to get on the, on the long list and then the short list for this project against many much larger, more well-known uh, consultancies. But the brief they gave us was 200 pages long. It was just extraordinary and it documented the whole process of design to manufacture to testing to marketing of this 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 team and this, mm. these cars because everything happens on the one site. And I remember sort of halfway through the project they had an interview stage or through the competition they had an interview moment where they visited the studio and we were just so underprepared for it. We were still sitting there with very little to show and um, trying to digest and wade through this brief. Mm. Um, and they sort of said, they kind of more or less wrote us off because they're like you have a lot to do and we're not really seeing anything and you've got two weeks left. But I think it was that sort of thoroughness that actually enabled us to somehow unlock something. That when yeah. we did come back to them, they were just really quite surprised and taken aback, but it actually unlocked the essence of what was some of their key underlying problems. So. You know, we often try and have that kind of level of approach to a project where it is really about getting to the essence of what is their difficulty. Mm. And, and how else do you find work? How else do you, um, do you actively go looking to move into certain sectors? Or uh, I think we made that decision uh, over the last few years, yes. Uh, I think we have to some extent been client-led and competition-led in the sense that we're interested in working in projects. Uh, we find them challenging, and we're we're very much interested in working with certain kinds of clients. Mm. So, if you want to talk about the relationship between urban design, uh, the city, and architecture, not every client is going to be able to have that conversation yeah. with you. So, you need clients that either have large estates or have the capacity to have a very long term view because they have that genuine interest, and mm. it's not just an immediate. Uh, assessment of a five or ten year window. It's it's a wider conversation about the project. So that that has meant we've ended up working with some of the great estates in London. It's meant we've worked with uh, universities who are bigger campuses, um, like the University of Oxford. You know, and then it also a very long term view. Every decision you make with them sits in the context of them having been around for a few hundred years and, yeah. and fully anticipating to be around for a few hundred more. Um, so that's, I think, guided our focus on who we'd like to work for. Um, but we have made sort of intentional uh, decisions to work, to do something, for example, with workplace and office space, just because we are interested in it. Um, and it's changing in a, in a really interesting way. Mm. And I think there's a thinking behind it uh, that's changing, that it's introducing a much more fluid idea of the workspace and again its relationship to the ground floor of the city and a more mixed use kind of uh, range of environments around it. So they're all questions we're interested in. Yeah. Um, so we've, we've certainly gone out and sort of tried to meet people who, who seem to be saying those kinds of things. Mm. And I'm interested from, from your perspective how important, I mean uh, is next? Is this your first business, or you've had a 
series of other businesses before? Or? It's, it's my first architectural business. Yes. Um, I've had all kinds of other businesses. I think I started my first business when I was nine. Brilliant. Which was a sweet shop, um, <laughs> which I used to run <laughs> from, from the front of my house, from like the porch of the conservatory, the front of the house. And I used to buy all these penny sweets from um, um, some of our family had, had retail businesses. So I would go and buy these boxes of penny sweets. And, and at a certain point, I used to do it over the holidays and it grew to such an extent that you know, it was hundred, hundreds of pounds a week. I was having to go buy to the, at the wholesalers. Um, and it turned into a great little business for like a, a 12, 13 year old. Yeah. Um, I had three staff and, <laughs> <laughs> and at a certain point it, it, it ended up getting, um, getting so out of control that the, the tax revenue commissioners called really? at the door and said, you know, we've had a complaint from concerned neighbors who frankly are just tired of their, their, their children draining them of spare change. Um, and if you're a business, you need to apply for a license and you need to be filing tax returns and everything. And when they came to the door, they, they asked for, is kind of Mr. Allen there? And I was like, yeah, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was my first one. Then I, there were various other ones like car washes and other businesses in university, um, which were great experiences. Yeah. Um, and, and certainly a good way to earn uh, discretionary income. Well, it's, it's interesting that there is this obviously you know the entrepreneurial spirit is kind of in your dna mm. how does that manifest itself in what you're doing now or how do those because sometimes these early ventures can be quite informative in many ways yeah can, can you see any kind of connection between I, I think in a way i do and in a way i don't i do in the sense that uh it, you it makes you much more comfortable with risk yes like that step to take to say well i'm you go, you're going to start a business and where is, where is our clients going to come from, where mm. our projects are going to come from. You have to be comfortable with a level of uncertainty. So I think there, absolutely. Um, where I don't see it, and I, maybe I'm not seeing it yet, is just in the sense that in some ways our discipline is very anti-entrepreneurial in that it, it sort of we plow a very deep furrow and a very singular kind of idea of our of our profession mm. and i think that blinkers us to other opportunities um and maybe being we should be much more flexible in thinking about what is an architecture firm like in the 21st century in the face of you know pressing challenges at, at a level of society that there's there's a lot to address yeah uh, but also uh, incredible technological change that's you know our business worlds are being rewritten as we sort of sit here and 10 years into the business you do wonder well are we always just going to be doing designing buildings mm. or is there some other way we can bring this kind of thinking to other domains and it's, and it's quite interesting as well it kind of goes back as well as the ability to be able to manage that risk mm. um, and risk manifesting itself in many different ways and it might be of you know stepping outside of what you're comfortable doing and going into a different discipline or industry and trying something else yeah for you how how does next manage risk and how do you personally where where are the things that you take risks well i think in some ways actually we've probably been, i've probably been quite conservative just because we're still doing like our primary focus is buildings yeah um so in that sense we're probably quite traditional um i mean we've got into interiors we've got into urban design a bit but you know it's still it's at its core at its essence it's quite architectural and that's partly by choice i suppose because i happen to love architecture and buildings and designing yeah. them um and enjoying architectural spaces. Um, but in other respects, you know, we, we've taken probably huge risks with trying to build a portfolio in, in a certain way. Mm. And that hasn't been easy. It's taken a long time. Some of the projects we've been working on have taken four, five, six years to build. So there's been a very long time in our trajectory where we actually have gone to meet people and we've got very little to show them. Mm. Um, apart from ideas uh, and kind of images and drawings and you know that 
it takes time to build that credibility. I think finally, sort of now coming into year 10, we've hit a certain threshold where we've actually, this last year, this last two years, have been hugely important to us because some of those projects that have taken a very long time have, have been completed. Uh, for example, the pier down on the Thames has just opened. Uh, we've been working on that since 2016. Uh, the restaurant uh, on the King's Road, the Duke of York uh, Square building, we've been working for this is the, the, six the, years. The Cadogan. Yeah, yeah the State Cadogan. Yeah. yeah. So that's finished and it's open and, uh, and doing hugely well. And, and then the Royal Air Force Museum, which yeah. opened last year, so that was another four-year project. Um, so we've been quietly kind of plugging away for a very long time um, uh, with, with a very thin portfolio. But now yeah. actually, you know, we're able to take people to these things and say, this is what we can do. And there is a vision there, but there's also a capacity to actually realize that uh, on time and on budget to all the constraints that, that we all have. And it's, it's interesting that you that you say that because obviously the nature of what we do as architects is that, you know, particularly ambitious projects, they do take time. And mm. like and for clients, it's difficult to show them drawings to, to sell something. A client wants to see, if, you know, a client can understand a finished building product. But yet as an architect, there may be this phase of, you know, maybe the first decade of its existence where these projects are taking a long period of time. Yep. What were the sorts of skills that you think that you and your team are very good at, at navigating a client's uh, feeling of security? Um, I think we have a fairly good capacity to really find clarity in the concepts we bring to, pe bring to projects. Mm. Um, and that really does help because uh, some of the projects and, and a lot of these have been learning experience for us. For example, with, with the Cadogan project, it, it, I never anticipated the level of scrutiny the project would undergo and, and the number of stakeholders we would have to deal with from uh, uh, planners to uh, heritage uh, the heritage inspections to local residents to local conservation groups and individual residents and it was just really quite extraordinary the level of uh, interest and interrogation the project went through and to be able to take that through so many stakeholders uh, I think has been an experience and a skill that will stand to us mm -hmm. for a very long time and I think we were really fortunate to have the benefit of a client who had the patience to do that you know, who saw the project as a very long-term thing and it sat within a number of other projects they were doing and the relationship uh, with the community was of paramount importance to them, that they were really sensitive about how that conversation unfolded. Mm -hmm. And in a way, there was times the project w was on hold for a year while another project that had sensitivities around its redevelopment went forward. And you know, so we had that time um, slightly frustrating not to be able to kind of continue to work on them, but also hugely important in terms yeah. of developing the nuance uh, to be able to manage that process and not let it go awry. Uh, and that hugely uh, was hugely helpful and beneficial taking that skill to the, to the Royal Air Force Museum, where again you have a huge number of stakeholders, but mm. with slightly different priorities. Um, and, and also to take, to be, to be able to take a vision in the, in the case of the museum to the likes of the HLF and win incredibly competitive funding. Um, so I think we're able to articulate uh, a client's ambition and their vision and articulate a technical or a, a creative response to that quite well, which is, I think, hugely important in any of these projects. And how have you, so with many of these projects, uh, you know, that, well, and lots of architectural firms will go through having early projects that will be stopped <coughs> starting, and it, that kind of causes all sorts of ups and downs mm. internally. What are some of the obstacles that you've overcome in building NECS as a, as a team, as a culture, um, whilst growing over the, over the first decade? Um, I think projects being prolonged has been challenging. Mm. 
um, and taking a long time. It, it's been more challenging than I kind of realized just because finding follow on work has, hasn't been straightforward. Yeah. Um, because you don't have a, a ready-made portfolio after two or three or four years that you can go out and present to the world. Um, so that has taken a, a, a huge degree of just patience in that growing just will be something that comes a bit more slowly. Yeah. Um, I think the other challenge has, has also been to some degree the team. I think in the first few years, you know, you focus so much on the work and, and winning the projects that actually I think I've certainly realized in in the last four or five years that actually it's the team that's fundamentally important and I probably have paid a lot more attention to that in the last few years mm. and it's it's this building of culture that's just as important as the building of projects yeah and I think I've become much more aware of the fact that actually you know in a way possibly the greatest design project will ever do will be designing the office and the culture as much as any building because one leads to the other yes so I think that's been something that I didn't appreciate at the beginning and, and for you what does building the team and the culture mean what types of activities does that that entail because it's, it's, it's very common for architects um, to be so in the business and so involved in the designing of projects <coughs> that the designing of the business often gets neglected mm. um, and there can be a kind of a conflicting relationship and as you said that you've kind of you've quite uh, well articulated how there is this conflict between the entrepreneurial and commercial drivers for the business and mm. what it yeah. is that we do as architects which is ultimately like why we started the business in the first place how how have you kind of navigated those I think we're still trying to navigate it. You know, it's something that's evolving. And I think um, we do kind of regular activities together. But I think more importantly, what I'm, what I'm trying to develop with, with a young team is that, you know, just this sense of uh, a kind of radical openness to focus mm. on the project and the ideas uh, and a, particip a sense of participation that's you know that's very um flat mm. in a way so and i think it's sometimes a difficult balance because what i found before is you can you can open out the opportunity to take responsibility uh very early to people and even part ones who come in here uh are kind of sometimes astounded at the level of uh, not just responsibility they get, but the kind of level of uh, participation that's expected. Mm -hmm. and, and that kind of carries right up through it. And, you know, I've realized over time that sometimes that can be overwhelming as well, that you need to balance the opportunity for responsibility um, with a sense of security and coaching and mentorship that's quite strong. So I think that's a balance that's different for in every individual. Yeah. Uh, and I think certainly there's some people we've we've had through here, uh, some amazing people that uh, are no longer here. That you know sometimes maybe we didn't get that right. Maybe they didn't get enough responsibility, or maybe actually they got too much. And it's something you can do for a while, but actually you feel you know worn out by it. Yeah. Um, but I think we've got much better at getting that balance right. Um, what's we'll see. what's what's next for next? Well, we're working on a whole range of stuff at the moment, which is kind of amazing. Uh, so we're busy with um, uh, a workspace for about a thousand people uh, over in Regent's Park. We've been working with British Land for the last year. Uh, that's on site now, and we're working on a couple of other projects mm. with them. And it's been really interesting dialogue uh, about workplace and, and how it's changing and we really enjoyed it um, and we're starting to look at more mixed use things with them uh, we're working on this fantastic sort of library with Giles uh, our George Gilbert Scott library uh, up in Oxford for Exeter College uh, which we won um, sort of midway through the year and that's a really interesting balance between heritage and, and, uh, and new intervention um, we're doing some tech workspace up in Cambridge as well uh, with you and I, uh, which is early stages. Uh, right. 
couple of residential projects, uh, some other housing, early housing feasibility for the university in Cambridge as well. So it's a, it's a broad mix that continues this kind of, I suppose, breadth that we like to bring and, a, and, a, and with a range of clients that you can have this engagement with the urban realm and urban design too. So I think that's, that's what we're focused on in terms of the team. I think we're, we're optimistic about a bit of growth in the, in the near future of the next year or two. Great. So we'll see. And if you had any final words of advice for uh, say a young architect starting up on their biz in their business, what would that be? And, and particularly in relation to just, uh, we were talking earlier about the role of the entrepreneur versus the role of the architect and how to kind of bridge those. Because sometimes, I mean, I think architects can make very good business people, very mm. good entrepreneurs. And sometimes it doesn't come so naturally. And how, what would you say as advice to, to be able to bridge the two? Um, I mean, most importantly, is, is be ambitious and, and take some risk, especially when you're young. There's, there's really nothing you can lose. I think when I, the day I decided to resign, I mean, I was, I, I kind of came down to, well, the worst that can happen is I have to get a job again. Yeah. In six months or however long I can, I can last. And, you know, actually that may not have turned out to be the case given what happened in 2009. There may have been no jobs to get. Um, but the, the way it unfolded was we, we won our first competition two months later and, and actually that oddly had an enormous uh, uh, compensation or it was enormous prize money attached to it. Mm -hmm. So that helps, you know, so you just, you know, somehow you have to just be ambitious and take the step and somehow it'll work out. Um, otherwise, I think, I think the real challenge for us as a discipline is to try and open ourselves up a bit. Um, and look at the ways, the material and non-material ways that our world is changing and not somehow miss that because, you know, the way technology is changing and we were talking earlier about, you know, how you bring architectural thinking to all kinds of other domains in terms of designing content or information or people's experience. Yeah. And I think there is a very interesting crossover between architectural space and thinking about people's experience through space to thinking about you know, people's experience through navigating all kinds of other information. Yes. Um, that's hugely relevant and perhaps if we lose sight of that, we hugely undervalue uh, our capacity as designers and thinkers. It's, it's interesting, we see so many different disciplines and industries pinching the word architect. Totally. And, and using it, <clears throat> and yet actually as an architect, the, the, the we have access into these other kinds of disciplines as well with a mm. very sort of specific skill sets, not for everybody, but it's there and to sort of start viewing architectural training as a kind of foundation uh, which can open up doors into all sorts of other industries and I personally would love to see universities bridging that gap as soon as possible or as early on in your career. I think that's really, it's a very important thing we should we should be looking for from universities. I think there's a there's a, a very long discussion involved debate about is the purpose of university to prepare you for the workplace or is it to, to teach you ways of thinking mm -hmm. and understanding knowledge. And I'm, I'm having been a teacher at the AA as well as a student, I, I do come down on the side of actually the latter, that the importance of universities is about teaching you ways of thinking and navigating our world. Um, and in a way teaching you for the discipline or the profession that doesn't yet exist rather than uh, certifying you in, in ways of practice that do already exist or well understood. Um, but I think we need to change, you know, the model of, of education is also arguably too ingrained in a kind of idea of professionalism in our discipline, that if there was a way of breaking it down for the first few years at least that exposed you to a broader uh, range of disciplines, whether it's content design or technology, mm. that then at a certain point, as I said, with, with you could make a decision after an undergraduate period that you could go do something else without feeling like you're sacrificing 
a huge number of years, I think that would be a really important step to take yeah. for it, our education. It's, it's really interesting because, uh, you know, it's, it's back, there's so many, there's, what's very unique about architecture is that it is so broad. Mm. And for some people, architecture is about the you know, organization of physical space and how that relates into mm. something physically in the urban environment. For other people, it is more of a way of thinking mm -hmm. and speculating about things. So you have these kinds of uh, this demand from practice sometimes saying, well, the students are not coming out as fully fledged, ready to go, part ones who can just drop into a project and start doing planning applications. Mm. And yet that's not, as you say, that's not the purpose of education. The purpose of education is to be able to speculate about the possibility of what it could be to be an architect. But also inside of that, when we're speculating about what, what that, those possibilities are, there needs to be sort of bridges into how to make those reality, or how to connect into you know, actual commercial realism, yep. or how, how that can become a business. I do, and I, I think um, part of the problem I see with some courses is that they, they very strongly hold the idea that the purpose of education is about teaching you how to think but on the other hand they end up focusing very narrowly on, on the on the idea of an architectural project as somehow a justification in itself that it's just a form of speculation and and that you know I do you do wonder like where is this where does where do you take that where yeah. do you take that as a set of skills as a set of abilities if, if you just take it out to the world and then all of a sudden someone drum drops a load of budget and uh, environmental, physical, legislative constraints on top of you, you just lose the project completely. You yeah. know, it just, it, so there is no, uh, you do wonder about the value of that. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, th there's, there's big questions around architectural education that need, that need to be reconsidered. Um, but you know, there are, there are places that are doing it. Yeah, brilliant. Alan, thank you so much for your time today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Welcome. It's been a pleasure. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. And don't forget to book your 15 minute chat with me by using the link in the information. I look forward to speaking with you. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.